I am delighted to welcome you. My name is Ken Goldberg. I'm a professor in the College of Engineering, in Industrial Engineering, Computer Science, and here at Citrus I direct the Data and Democracy Initiative. I want to welcome everyone here and all everyone who's on the web. And I want to remind those who are here or eating lunches to remember to, to, to recycle. And there's compost um, and recycling bins in the back of the room. We're trying to be really green and energy and uh, environmentally conscious. also want to announce that we have a major event that's going to be in this room tomorrow. It's called the um, Open Data Conference. It's uh, about open government data. How can data improve democratic governance? We have an amazing group of speakers that are coming in, and unfortunately, I can't invite you. If you haven't registered to it yet, it's too late. It's full. So we're going to have Gavin Newsom, the Lieutenant Governor of California, is going to give us uh, a talk in the afternoon. We have a whole host of other, um, other speakers as well. But the good news is the whole event will be available on the web sometime after the event tomorrow. Also, I want to mention Jaron Lanier, the... Uh, the, the musician, inventor who's, who coined the term virtual reality. He has moved the date, so he's going to be on October 14th at 11 a.m. And his topic is provocative. How can we prevent information technology from destroying the middle class? And then the big ideas competition is now open. Um, Pre-proposals are due by November 4th. And I also want to announce that there's not going to be any um, research exchange this week or next week. So that brings us to our, um, our research exchange today, and we're delighted to, um, to, to host uh, uh, someone who's been a friend, and a colleague, and actually a graduate of, uh, of our program here at Berkeley. He, um, Piero, did his um, dissertation here, right here at Berkeley. He's got his PhD from Lotfi Sada, who is, we're delighted to have sitting here in the front row. And Piero went on to do many, many great things. He's become an expert in... Um, in the field of soft computing. He, has, um, he, became, he is now a chief scientist at General Electric Global Research. He's been a pioneer in areas like fuzzy logic, AI, soft computing, approximate reasoning systems. He's applied it to a whole host of really interesting applications like everything from maintenance of locomotives to um, determining the value, estimating the value of single family homes, to estimating insurance, um, the property of insurance policies, to applying um, fuzzy logic and to, to a host of different um, products uh, like dishwashers, locomotives, power supplies. He's, a, he's been recognized very widely in the field by his colleagues. He's been editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Approximate Reasoning for 13 years. Bravo. Long sentence. That's <laughs> a long sentence. Um, he's, uh, he's co-edited six books. He has uh, over 150 publications. He was president of the IEEE Neural Network Society, and he has, um, he has received 67 United States patents. So please join me in welcoming Piero Buonasone. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be back to my alma mater, and it's a great pleasure to see my former advisor, I should say my advisor of every time because I can still, still use Lotf as, uh, ro as a role model in my current days. Um, let me start uh, very quickly with, uh, first of all, the ter the, I tried to shape the presentation in a way that it would not be overly technical given that the audience is quite heterogeneous and yet I don't want to be lame. So what I tried to do, I tried to say, well, how did all these technology events and technology evolution change my career, change my job? So it's a retrospective view of how my role has changed over time as a result of our understanding and, to some extent, the commoditization of some of our previous tasks. So uh, let's parse the title. There is an aspect of industrial internet, which is a new term coined quite recently to uh, sometimes referring uh, to the third wave, the third type of uh, revolution. Uh, I'll explain that in a moment. By data-driven analytics, I'm uh, focusing mostly on uh, machine learning, computational intelligence-driven technologies, 
to model physical systems, behavior. And uh, trying to be, because it's lunch, I say there is a BC before the, the cloud analytics, which is pretty primitive. Uh, then uh, the cloud is, we don't have to talk about it, just the enabler. So now after the cloud, how uh, AC, right? After the cloud, I should be Anus Domino, but I couldn't find the acronym there. How is that change? How we're doing it? Uh, but more importantly, in which direction are we going? And in particular, I want to talk about crowdsourcing, how we have commoditized some of the model building at some simple level, but uh, so we can get a larger scale. And uh, model agnostic fusion means I want to have an ensemble of these crowdsourced models, treating them as black boxes. That's what agnostic means. And how can I leverage that? Given that I don't want to fight it, I want to harness the power of that. Uh, if I don't sp spend too much time talking, we'll get to see some of the experiments and uh, some conclusion and where we're going with research trends. So that's the menu. Let's talk about the three waves. The first one is pretty old, the Industrial Revolution. It came with the steam engine. And it transformed transportation, urban centers, and communications. It sure left an impact on, uh, on the way we're consuming resources, but we're trying to modify that a little bit. The second wave is the Internet Revolution. And what was it? Well, 50 years ago? Well, it, it was when uh, uh, mainframes were able to exchange information with information packets, and that was really the key for then enabling what we know now as the internet. Uh, and it was uh, very uh, horizontal structures as opposite to the uh, hierarchical structure of the Industrial Revolution and distributed, distributed uh, intelligence and e-commerce. So the industrial internet is now when um, machines are talking to machines, machines are talking to people. Uh, as a result, there is a hyper-connectivity that Informa uh, Internet of Things is sort of the basis of that connectivity. And as a result, we also uh, need to push intelligence at the edge, have brighter machines. We are collecting a large amount of data as a result. And we now need analytics that can scale up to that size of data. So that is the description of industrial Internet. I, I'm already preempted a slide further down that that was the cross, the, the four pillars of industrial internet. Uh, another way to look at it is to see at uh, uh, Web 1.0, which is in, two, in the 2000 was mostly with digital telecommunication. And uh, it's interesting to see that there were companies like MCI who never adopted and people probably by now have forgotten that MCI existed, right? Then in the mid-2000s, it was a consumer internet or web 2.0, internet 2.0. And it was basically, uh, again, the, the, we had uh, Amazon, Kindle, iTunes, Prospering, and unfortunately, some of my favorites like Borders and Tower Records, right, disappeared because they stayed analog. So this is a disruptive change. And the third disruptive change is with... Uh, 3.0, which is now in the industrial setting instead of a consumer setting. So it's another way of seeing what we mean by industrial internet, right? It's exactly the same, but now we're doing with industrial assets. And uh, this is pretty much what I've mentioned, uh, the hyperconnectivity, intelligence at the edge, democratization of data, because now we're collecting a large number of data. We also did it before, and even before we didn't know what to do with that, now we're trying to make progress in handling the, those volumes. But it's not just volume, it's at least the three Vs. We'll get to that later on, which is volume, velocity, and variability. And uh, there's a little commercial here and at the end, which is we are betting a lot of resources on this as a company, and uh, we're trying to, to show the, the results. I'll focus on the data-driven analytics. And this is just an example. Uh, I'm sure most of the consumer's view of General Electric is light bulbs and appliances, and that's such, such a tiny fraction of what we do. Most of the output of GE is in the industrial rather than the commercial sector. 
So we manufacture aircraft engines, locomotives, turbines for generating electricity, turbines for uh, pumping oil, uh, for providing the power to, to pump oil, uh, turbines that fly, right? aircraft engines, all, all rotating machinery. And uh, as such, we're collecting a large number of data from our customers. The, the business model, because one would say, why, why does GE care about this, right? As a manufacturer, you have very small margins on what you're making, but you want to increase your installed basis. Then, after the warranty period is over, the customer needs to maintain those assets, and they can do it in a transactional base, you know, every, a la carte, every time that something is wrong, we, they'll call us and we'll fix it. Or we can have a contractual service agreement, or CSA, which is uh, basically they pay a fixed amount and we are responsible not just for the maintenance but for the performance of the assets. So we have to guarantee in some cases a certain level of efficiency or thrust. And uh, that is a win-win because they do not have downtime. We have visibility into the asset while it's working, while it's operating, so we can detect anomalies earlier on, in the, eliminate the false positives, and understand which are incipient failures. Trying to see would they be escalating, we, uh, what, what is causing, which is diagnostics. I'll get to that in a moment again. And more importantly, how much longer would it last, which is prognostics, right, remaining useful life. That gives you then the, the interval over which you want to take an action and optimize. So the idea is to change from unplanned maintenance events to planned maintenance events. And that, of course, is much more cost effective, and that's a business model. In order to do that, you need a very powerful analytics that from the data and from your domain knowledge can tell you, the, explain the past and predict the future behavior of these assets. And the motivation. So I already talked about this, but it's important to nail them down again. It's where we have remote monitoring. Uh, anomaly detection simply means I have a structure that defies normal behavior. Could be more than one. I could have multiple operating points, but I know that this fleet under this condition, this fleet of assets, behave this way. When I have some statistically significant deviation of one unit, I start raising a flag. And again, because I'm monitoring real time, I can, if, I, if it's a real flag, if it's a real problem, I can try to fix it before it escalates. The root cause isolation is trying to find the possible reason. And the prognostics is the most difficult part of all this. So if I were to think in terms of system analysis, this is state estimation and state projection, right? The state projection, which is the prognostics, is difficult because we tend not to have run-to-failure data. Run-to-failure data means, okay, I'm gonna, I estimate it's going to die in five days. Let's watch it. Right? And I collect data over the next five days and say, yes, it died. Well, I go, it's great for a modeler, but it's bad for business. So if I fix it tomorrow, I censor my data stream. So it's statistically censored to the right. Meaning that the rest of the four days is an extrapolation. My models, in, when I look historically at the data, do not have this nice trajectory to death in most of the applications. So I have large variances with my predictions. So if, for the prediction to be actionable, I cannot say this engine will last another 20 flights, plus or minus 15. I, it needs to be 20 flights plus or minus 2 to be useful. To, re to reduce this variance, I need to create a many way of doing it, but one is to have multiple models that are lowly correlated in their errors, such that then a fusion of an ensemble of such models will reduce the variance. And that's one of the approaches that we're taking. But after I've done that, then if, uh, if uh, interval or remaining useful life is very short, it's a fault accommodation and it's safety related and I have to do something on the fly. Otherwise, that's my optimization where I can change future operations. I can optimize uh, uh, maintenance schedules as well as supply chain management for the parts. And that is where I can become efficient in servicing my contracts. So that's where all the 
models are driving, right? I'm trying to do, anomaly detection is simply unsupervised learning. Diagnostic is supervised learning. Prognostic is regression. And the rest is smart control and optimization. So those would be the techniques that I, that I use to perform those functions. So let's look very quickly at uh, before the cloud. The BC cartoon pretty much describes it. I was a magician, right? I was a magician pulling the rabbit out of the head because I was giving a problem. I'll look at the data and carefully craft the solution. In fact, that was me <laughs> in the early 80s when we had the very first uh, locomotive uh, expert system. Uh, I have hair. <laughs> but uh, seriously, the, this is like trying to describe a scientific uh, method where I have a theory, I create a set of experiments to validate the theory or see if I can find something to refute it. Eventually, I'm satisfied with that. I try to encapsulate that theory with some axioms that I can then prove. Under some limited as computational assumption, I embody that theory into a tool. So, but I can get a license to MATLAB neural network toolbox, right? And I really have backpropagation and everything else in it. It doesn't make me an expert in using neural network. So in order to apply, I need to go through a long cycle from problem formulation to uh, crafting the features that will be the input to the models, to finding the parameters for the model, doing a, a functional validation, by getting the right results, uh, compiling it, and by getting the right throughput. And I'm the guy who is sitting in that loop, which, as I said, is great for job security, right? But what happens when a change happens? And it happens very often. In the past, they used to call me and say, hey, your system is not working anymore. So, oh, no, it's working exactly as when I left it with you. What happens is that the physical system right, is, has dynamics, which have no longer been captured by the model that we released. So there is a model obsolescence. And the whole idea is to have a, a model life cycle, which is usually neglected, certainly by the academic community, because they don't have deployed systems to maintain, right? After you've written a paper, nobody is going to use that model anymore. If you're deploying a, a model, how do you guarantee that it will be up to date? It's very, very difficult especially if you handcrafted the model. So my point is that little me had great job security, but I'm a bottleneck. I cannot survive in this MO. So this is just an example of uh, multiple uh, categorical data as well as real value data, different techniques that you can use to do anomaly detection. This is a hot and t square. So this is one example of what I probably did many times and repeated over and over without being able to reuse that solution in the past. So in the 2000s, I became lazy, right? That's a lazy magician. I said, well, why don't we use metaheuristics? So instead of my being in that tight loop with experiment, I have some evolutionary search, for instance, that searches in the model space for the right parameters, and if I get really sophisticated, also for the right structure of the models, until they hit something. And my job got upgraded. Now what I'm doing, I'm curating the reference set, which is a target for this evolutionary algorithm or other meta that I want to use to do design. So this was one trend. The other one was to start creating ensembles and fusion, but fusion was pretty much a static operation. I mean, in the, in the simplest case, it was just the average, arithmetic average of the output of the models. Later on, we realized that fusion is a model, it's a meta model. It's a model that reasons about the other models and does different things in a different context instead of being static. But as an example of that, I'll give you one in which we try to uh, look at a fleet of locomotives. Uh, this was from Union Pacific. And I tried to create a list from the anti-lemons to the lemons, from the most reliable locomotives to the least reliable locomotives. Could be locomotives, could be anything else. You want to know if you have some mission-critical assignment, you want to pick from the top. Right? 
This was sponsored by DARPA, among others, where the National Training Center, they had the routine uh, seven, seven days exercises, and they had mortality of, failures of equipment, not of, of about 45%. Okay, so it was really difficult then to pick the best units to put under stress in a mission critical, in that case training, but even worse in reality. So we said we don't have strikers at that time, that was what they were looking at, but we had locomotives, except for people do not shoot at locomotives, but they get a lot of aggravation and they have almost the same type of electromechanical systems. We looked at... Uh, the survey, we had sensors on the locomotive which uh, brought uh, information to the uh, service center about four times, three to four times a day. We had utilization data from the railroads. Uh, we had uh, a service center that cre uh, recommended a uh, possible fixture for the locomotives. And then we had the repairs that validated whether those uh, were correct or incorrect. So we mine all this data, and uh, let me just go quickly. Oops. And we use the, something called lazy learning, which is basically, uh, it's also known as uh, continuous case-based reasoning in AI. It's kernel-based models in statistics. That it's one and the same we, and with different semantics, but the same formula, where the model is in the data. Given a query, you find the closest point to your query in some magic feature space, which is the most difficult part to define. And then based on the output of those adjacent points, you come up with other, an interpolation or an extrapolation to come up with the answer to, to your query. Okay? And uh, so the key one, some of the key points was, uh, I, I'm gonna go into some technicalities just because I can't help it. Uh, most of these are based on distances. And if you have a distance in your feature space, it implies you have a metric space. What if you don't? What if you can compute that distance? Right? Now what? Because I put the distance as an argument in the kernel. Well, I scratch my head and say, what is a kernel? A kernel is nothing else than an n plus one array relationship. If I were to project it along each of my n dimensions, I'll get something like that, a membership function or a distribution, call it what, however you want it. I'm gonna, it's basically what do I mean by relatively close to my query in that dimension. So now if I have dimensions that have to do with miles per hour, that have to do with number of, of serial repairs per year, instead of adding them up in the square and then take a square root, I look within the same units of each dimension to say how close am I along this and I'm transforming this problem from computing a distance to finding the satisfaction of intersection of constraints along each of the dimension, which makes much more sense. So with having said that, I still need to find some parameters for A and B, which you can see A is the spread of the tolerance, if you wish, and B is how fast does the slope fall down. Plus I need some Ws, which are basically how do I select uh, these uh, units, x1, x2, and x3? Let's think of the Ws as being binary. Right? So I do a feature subset selection. And uh, how do I evaluate this? If you want to evaluate predictions, you have to go in the past, put a pause and say, okay, let's pretend that this is the present, and I evaluate my prediction, and then I see what happened. And I move a pause, and I do another evaluation. I move a pause, and I do another evaluation. And these posts were six months apart. Okay. I, I'm trying to go quickly because there isn't too much time. But the idea was that, uh, and we used evolutionary algorithm to basically come up with the best set of A's and B's for each of the dimensions. And the W's being binary would do the feature selection. So that was my chromosome. And using a wrapper approach, I basically evolved this over time and uh, picked the best uh, solution from the last population and found the prediction and then the classifier to say, well, is this in the top 20% or not? So that was the bar. Pick the, the best 20% of the fleet. Now, the problem was the fleet increased with size over time. So I really had two problems. One is 
if I pick 52, which were 20% of the first time, and then I the same 52, that is what random selection will do. That was my baseline, right? And uh, uh, using other type of heuristic, I was getting something better, while I, I get a very decent uh, improvement, about 10 times better than random, using the meta heuristics, the evolution. But this was looking at current without doing the, the forecast yet. When you do a forecast, it becomes more difficult. And uh, so we still evolved, uh, we, we kept the same 52 and that we seen 20% of the time. And we found that it was still a much better uh, result than uh, using other approaches. Why am I showing you this? Because this is the next slide. The next slide says, look at this graph and look at this. This is the performance of the model, say, at the first post. This is after I updated and when I updated again. This is applying the model which was six months old without any update and a, month, and a year later applying it again. You can see the deterioration of the model, obsolescence. So if unless I have automated the process for generating the model, I cannot automate its refreshing. And if I, have, if, I done, if I achieve this automation, I can do this more frequently and keep the model alive over time with the same amount of effort. This is a lazy, lazy magician. But again, these were not huge data size. I mentioned this was in the mid 2000s. So now we have the cloud. It changed everything, right? So now, how, I'm gonna skip a couple of things. We are uh, leveraging it now to say, okay, I have hundreds or, or of virtual machines and I have uh, hundreds of mini-me's in the cloud, each of which is running these experiments. What can I do, which is a low-hanging fruit? Well, we have a large number of legacy models. Legacy models which, where the parameters were frozen in time, and all of a sudden, these legacy models were generating a very large number of false positives without any uh, redeeming feature in terms of uh, providing better coverage of true positives. So we were able to use differential evolution, among others, uh, techniques to tune those parameters in the cloud, do massively, massive design of experiment, in essence, to refresh them. Uh, we, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the AMP lab and MLBs. We had an internal project called iScale, which started tw three years ago along the lines of MLBs, aimed at automating new model building. And uh, I want to spend a few more time on the fusion, otherwise I will not talk. But this is basically what the cloud allows me to do, right? Replicate this over and over in each virtual machine, and I can try out this uh, tuning of, uh, of a legacy system very, very. I still have a job, because I'm defining the problem formulation, how I want to do it, which kind of trade-offs I want to have between false positive and false negatives, where I want to be on the ROC curve, for instance. And uh, I still need to understand what to do with the models that I get. So keep this in mind. Uh, this is uh, our own rendition of uh, MLBase. So let, let me skip it. And now let's look at uh, crowdsourcing. Why am I doing that? Because just as I can generate many models in the cloud by by via of this virtual machine, I can also go to other sources of models, and crowdsourcing is one of them. So uh, this is taken from Tom Malone. Uh, you're collecting when the task is easily decomposable. You have multiple individuals working on these joint parts, and no collaboration is needed, and you just collect all the results. Uh, when one individual can provide the whole solution. A competition is a way of doing it. Why, when the one person is not enough and the tasks are not easily decomposable, you need collaboration. Okay. So what uh, crowdsourcing, uh, so this is a commercial for AMP because I, I found a great vision two years ago and I said, this is what I want to do. 
And I want to leverage what they're doing, but on top of that, I want to say, well, now that we have that as a basis, what else can we do? And I'll be talking about this lazy meta-learning, which is uh, modern agnostic fusion as the last part of my talk. But this is an important player. It's Kaggle. And Kaggle is uh, the five club for geeks, according to Business Week of last year. Uh, some of you are familiar with it. Others aren't. Uh, they basically a company, and GE did exactly that, goes to Kaggle and say, this is the problem we want to solve. Here's the data. This is a schedule. These are the performance function that I want, or objective functions I want you to follow. This is the price structure. This is the de deadline. Find me the best models at the end of the deadline. I'll acquire them through, by paying the price. So, it's, uh, so we did that, and I'll... As part of the experiment, I'll show you what we did and how we leverage it. But we're still, it's still a far cry from replacing people with some experience like myself. But what it's forcing me to do is to say, well, I can no longer, I could be another competitor in this, one, one of many, or I could step above and say, well, now that I have all this, what can I do that is better than just being a single competitor? Well, uh, so, it is now, uh, I mentioned crowdsourcing as one uh, possible way of doing it. Uh, there is an old-fashioned way of going to universities and uh, outsource it, the way we used to do it in the past. Uh, we can uh, use metaheuristics and general models. This is some work we've done with MIT, where they use their own cloud, and uh, they evolved a population of symbolic regressors for a specific problem, which I'm going to mention in a few minutes. And then uh, we did a, so they had over 5,000 models, right? And we used a two-dimensional uh, space of accuracy and complexity. It's easy to measure complexity with, in the, with a tree, right? Where a, a production tree that corresponds to a, an expression that is a symbolic regressor expression. And you could say anything which is below this performance, drop it. Everything which is above its complexity, drop it. And then we just took the Pareto. And we had like 50 or 60 models. So now that I show you the, of course, we can also go to where I live and say, hey, we have a job for you. I still have a job doing it. Uh, we can also use uh, existing products. So the idea is that regardless of the source, I want to be able to fuse models from multiple sources without knowing who did the model. Uh, let me skip this. So this is very quickly an idea of having hundreds of models here. And for each model, I need to have meta information. I need to know the region of applicability of the model in a, in a crude sense. It could be a hyper rectangle with uh, the coordinates of, all of my training points. Right? And the rectangle covers that, or it could be a, a better enclosure of the, of the density of those points. But more importantly, I want to have some compilation of the performance of, of those models, of each model, in that region. So when the, my query goes into a particular uh, sub-region, my CAR tree will tell me what is the performance in this smaller region and I can decide how much credence I want to give to that particular model. Again, uh, the problem was uh, a uh, coal fire boiler. That boiler is like the size of a building, by the way. It's a huge rotating ball, and you have about 22 or so inputs which are then regulated by the multivariable controllers. And that's how you're determining how you're going to run that particular plant. And you want to get uh, a load that you bid, so you have an equality constraint there. You want to stay below SO and CO constraints. But you're also generating uh, noxes, and you are burning fuel, so heat rate is inverse of that efficiency. And uh, you like to minimize noxes and minimize heat rate but the two are conflicting. Because at high temperature, you're better off with the efficiency, but you're terrible with the emissions. 
And uh, this was a multi-objective optimization. But the point is, in order to optimize, I need to be able to say, if I have this input, this would be the output. And I wanted to shrink that variance in that mapping. So the first thing we did was, uh, we have researchers at GE Research. So we built 30 neural networks using uh, bootstrapping to uh, perform, to have some diversity, and did a, a fusion of that. And you can tell, uh, so this is the error, and uh, the sigma of the error. But if I, if I take the mean absolute error, it's uh, highly correlated with sigma, but it's easy to visualize. Uh, these were all the models, the third neural networks. This was the regular average of those models. And this was the improvement that we got using this uh, fusion. This was uh, already going into uh, overfitting, so we dropped that. But this was a very robust improvement. And that was for the load, for the NOx, and for the heat rate. So then we said, okay, what about MIT? And they gave us about between 35 and 45 or so models for each of the outputs. And we did the same fusion and obtained, uh, interesting enough, uh, the performance of each of these models were not as good as, uh, as a neural network because at MIT we were concerned much more about coping with complexity than just improving accuracy. But yet, at the end, because it's much easier to inject diversity in a grammar, you can have, we, we used, for those of you who are technically inclined, it was an island approach. In different islands, we had different function sets. We actually used different grammars. And we had uh, different, slightly different uh, performance functions. So sometimes it was an RMSC, other times it was a maximum absolute error. And, uh, and we obtained a better diversity, which meant the fusion was actually 10% better than the, that of a neural network. And finally, when we put them all together, we really hit a jackpot. Okay? Uh, so this was an example of just evolving uh, models in the cloud trying to instill some diversity, which is still the challenge, but it's the key to have a successful fusion and getting it out. This is, unlike the Netflix competition, which some of you still remember, that sort of started this idea of let's go and have people competing. But in the Netflix competition, people had access to each other's code. So there was no uh, uh, independence. Right? I could just improve of what can just submit it, and uh, I'll get a, a little better result, but my model was not very difficult from what Ken's had. Would, if we win, we'll share the price, right? But here, everything was totally independent, which meant there was a less correlation of the errors of, of, the, of the five contestants. This is a picture of the first contestant. So in order to do a, a reasonable fusion, we needed to see what the models, how the models performed. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to the performance of a model in the training set. Because of the nature of a competition, uh, the training set uh, was, was obtained in real time and was posted. And as data was po were, were posted, the modelers would change the model until the final version, which says, okay, we're submitting this for validation. But for the final version, we didn't have the statistics on the entire training set. We only had it on the validation part, which was two weeks only. So we scratch our head and say, okay, let's take the first week to extract metadata on the models to see, to characterize the performance of the models. And then in the second half, we use that to drive a fusion. All I'm trying to show you here with green is that uh, the fusion was better, if I can get to, well, I'll point it with my finger. The fusion was better in five out of seven days than the best model of the day, which of course you don't know a priori which one it is. And this was a very uh, scarce metadata training. And also considering that each of these models were already an ensemble of models. So it, there is hope that this is going to improve. I'm trying to get there. In conclusion, what have we seen? We've seen crowdsourcing, the power of the people, right? We augmented with collaboration tools. 
or some infrastructure as the one provided by Kaggle. Um, analytics is still the secret sauce because I'm not convinced that my job is going to go away. I'm trying to raise the challenge and say, what can I do now that I have this new situation? I'm no longer doing the, what is at this level. I want to do one level up, which is why I say harnessing it is important. I got, I must say, I got inspired by AMP in terms of uh, looking at the intersection of, of these two components. And third one is sort of infrastructure for doing all this with the uh, system tools. Uh, I am convinced that we need to do a better job here. So model agnostic fusion means characterize the models as black boxes and then in a manner similar to lazy learning. Lazy meta learning means for a given query which subset of my model should I use to generate the answer. I'll leave you with this slide, that's two slides that say, what are, where are we going from here? And I see uh, uh, automate scalability for data-driven model is a must. We talk about the three Vs. Uh, Human-machine interaction has changed a lot, so those are the three Vs. I'm not going to spend any time on that. This is very important just as you have some statistical tools that can be used by non-statisticians to get descriptive statistics very simply. I should also have something like ML Base or iScale that generates machine learning models for non-machine learning experts. Cloud sourcing is another example in which you can have a crowd playing a variety of roles from the creation to the critic of the models. Um, visualization of the results. Uh, we're still the bottleneck when it comes to, you know, if you look at Moore's uh, law, everything else is evolving very, very fast except for us. So we're still stuck understanding and visualizing high dimensional spaces and even more so if it's hierarchical. So a lot of work has to be done. It was, there was a great paper on extreme scale visual analytics. Uh, temporal data is something that is very dear to us and it's important because time series of assets while they're working is a critical case uh, for us and we need to spend more time. Uh, and if I were to skip, for decision making uh, and uncertainty is not the traditional decision making under uncertainty, it's blink. Meaning, if I can allow a certain extra time and computer resources, how much better will my confidence be? Okay, that's, I think it's vital. Uh, fusion, I talk about model agnostic fusion, but we also have physics and data-driven models, same as structured and unstructured data. And this is key. If I want to do any fusion, I need to be able to inject diversity. And there are many, many ways of doing it. None of them is perfect. Uh, model life cycle is the last uh, aspect because it has to do with keeping the model alive. And if I were to summarize with one sentence, it's, PHM, prognostics and health management, for models instead of assets. I want to do anomaly detection of my model. I want to do diagnostics. How much longer can I use this model, prognostics? How can I patch it for the accommodation? How can I regenerate automatically optimization? Okay? This is all I had in mind. And uh, as a commercial, I want to say, yes, we are hiring. And if you, are, if you have any interest in uh, the modeling aspect uh, in, uh, in the scale of big data and uh, anything that I presented so far, uh, uh, two of our recruiters at the end with the G logo who can, uh, uh, and you can talk to them. But anyway, and, and this is the landing page. Thank you very much. Okay, please. Thank you, Pierre. This is great. Well, I'm curious about where, what are the opportunities for us at Berkeley who you know, aren't, aren't going to be graduating and moving on? Um, what is, are there opportunities for us to get involved in this industrial internet and some of the research here? I know that you're involved with the AMP Lab. I'm curious if there are, what, what opportunities are there or other elsewhere for doing new research that you see? I believe the answer is yes, uh, especially since some of the uh, IP issues that I think are totally solved or completely solved between 
UC Berkeley and, and, and private companies. It would be delightful if we could talk more about it. Uh, we, we can find the opportunities, whether it's uh, intern, in technology transfer or another opportunity is to go and uh, take the research that you've done, say the 6.1, and, and get some government funding for 6.2 or 6.3. So b both avenues would be. Mike. On your uh, conclusion slide, you had quite a uh, list of uh, topics to be addressed. I was wondering if you uh, have some ideas on prioritizing those and oh, which yes. are the ones I, that I, need the most work. Uh, absolutely. If I were to, in my priority, I said, as an industry, this is number one. Because there's no point in creating models. Uh, take the Kaggle example. Okay. The only way to update those models is to contact the winners and say, could you rerun the models for me? Right? Uh, the, this one is also important for a different reason because I think we're going to have a proliferation and there will be a commoditization of low-level analytics. And you can say, well, fine, so it's there. Well, better yet, how can I leverage it? And uh, probably the same level, I'll say this is number three. I'm taking for granted. I'm taking one for granted. This has such a so many different flavors as to how we can better interact with this evolving system, and uh, we are sort of a little bit handicapped. <laughs> as I said, I mean, our, our cognitive functions are the one that were 50 years ago, right? We haven't doubled <laughs> every every uh, every year and a half. So. Uh, I mean, crowdsourcing, you can teach me about the role that crowdsourcing takes, but again, it's not just, it could be from generating information, such as labeling, right, to creating the models, to criticizing the models and, and, and make changes, or, or do post uh, processing. So much, but I'll pick those three areas as, uh, as my priority. Good question. Yes, please. Maybe this is, a, this is a question of scope and scale, not, not so much numbers, but taking the, the, the locomotive, uh, exam, locomotive fleet example and, and the observation, the, the, the modeling system and the modeling management and fusion uh, systems you built on top of it, if, if you try and transition that to, say, the North American vehicle fleet, yeah. uh, what, what issues come up in that sense, uh, even dropping back down to the actual units there, you have to somehow characterize or, or compensate for usage. Uh, right, and, right. And, yeah. and, but, however, the, the, if we can extrapolate... Uh, I think the ahead, truck the, the, industry the data would, uh, would be such a simple analogy. Uh, you know, was commercial trucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you also have Please. the... Uh, because you have a little more... Uh, uh, information about the uh, transit, the load that they carried, and so on. Uh, to some extent, all that experiment was in, was taking the cross product of operation and service, right? Because if a unit was not operated, obviously it had a great service record. It was there wasn't any load put on it, right? Or the opposite is true: if a unit was over overloaded, yeah, it might show. So. The, we generated at that time about 60 or 70 possible features. So feature within the model development, feature engineering is probably the key phrase that says, how can I take this data and transform it into inputs for my model? Those would be the features. I can come up with a lot of features. Some of them would be redundant. Some of them would be extremely valuable. And I may have some domain knowledge, but it's not enough for me to discriminate. I want automation for that. I need automation for that, and I need cloud scale automation for that. Today, sometimes they, in database they call it uh, extract load and transform ELT. But that's sort of a, a very crude way of thinking of feature engineering. It, it's, it's an analogy. But I want that kind of uh, automation for taking large data sets and coming up with the best features. Remember, I want a small number of features because the higher the number of inputs, the more 
I, the higher the complexity of my model, the more I'm risking uh, overfitting the model, and so on. So it's, information theory gives us a lot of guidance for that. But, uh, and in the past, we did it manually on a smaller scale. I'm saying there's plenty of research space for improving that situation. Okay, well, thank you very much. Sorry for taking a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs>